now want to turn the time over to William Deaver. I know many of you have come specifically to hear him. What a delightful person it is and what a privilege it is for us to have him here. This November, he'll be celebrating his 80th birthday. He used to travel very extensively. He is now quite selective about the places that he comes, and we are very privileged to have him. Gary tracked him down. He now lives half of the year in Cyprus, and it's a little hard to reach this man because he does not use internet <laughs> or email. So uh, you know he's the real thing. He and I have talked about old things a lot in the last couple days. He's a true archaeologist when it's got to be real old for him to want to use it. <laughs> You've seen many of his books, and you'll be happy to know that he has now completed his autobiography, uh, which will be uh, submitted to uh, printers. He's not quite sure where it will be printed yet, but he's finished with that. And also his magnum opus, which will be a history of Israel in the Iron Age. Uh, he has been a very influential scholar in biblical archaeology. He's redefined biblical archaeology throughout his career. And uh, this, this book about the history of Israel will be something you'll all want to, uh, want to have. Educated at Harvard, he's been very influential in academic circles ever since the 1960s. He's gotten his hands dirty in a lot of ways, but especially out doing dirt archaeology. And uh, for 30 years, he ran the archaeology department at the University of Arizona in Tucson. And uh, finally, let me say that uh, what he'll be speaking about today, about uh, Asherah and uh, uh, the role of Asherah in uh, Iron Age Israel and uh, uh, pre-exilic Israelite religion, was received initially with a great deal of skepticism. Now, as he was telling me, Almost everyone just accepts this as a given, but what they've forgotten is where they learned it. <laughs> and they learned it from Bill Deaver. Please welcome him. We're glad to have him. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I want to thank uh, Jack Welch and Gary Anderson for inviting me. Like uh, Margaret, I've come from a long distance from the East Coast, but I remembered to bring my passport, and here I am on the Western frontier. <laughs> uh, my presentation will be based on the 2005 book, uh, Did God Have a Wife? Archaeology and Folk Religion in Ancient Israel. Now, the title is already alarming to some people, although I think not to most of you. I try to put people at ease by saying, well, well yes, he did have a wife, but he divorced her, so it's all right. <laughs> and she got everything. Uh, God got the Jewish people, which was not a bargain. <laughs> now, in theory, it ought to be easy to talk about Israelite religion. You just go to the Bible and read it. It's all about religion. But if you think about it for a moment, the Hebrew Bible or the Christian Old Testament is not a very good source for reconstructing the real religions of ancient Israel for many reasons. First of all, the text as we have it was put together after the history of Israel was over after the fall of Jerusalem in the exile. And the Bible, which is not a book, but a whole library of books, was written by a, a handful of elites, and they were all men. Do you think if we'd had a women's Bible, it might be different? Oh, yes. But these were elites. They were members of ultra-right-wing orthodox nationalist parties. And what they did was to do revisionist history. They rewrote the history of Israel, although they had old sources. And that's the story we have it today. Now, I ask you to remember that the Bible is a minority report <laughs> written by a small committee. It provides an idealistic picture of what Israel should have been, but never was. It would have been had they been in charge, but they never were. <laughs> so what you get is a portrait, all right, but it is a portrait of a certain Israel that is a later construct. Where would you go to find out about the real Israel in the Iron Age? Another source, and Margaret talked about several sources, 
and brought to you a lot of fresh insights from sources that are neglected, now I have another source, archaeology. Archaeology is about a real people in a real time and a real place. They really did exist, and now we know a lot about them. Remember in Daniel 12, there's a wonderful phrase for all those who sleep in the dust. Those forgotten people, who in the words of Eric Wolf, are the people without a history, without any written history. Those anonymous masses that have been forgotten. Archaeology brings them back to life and gives them a voice and allows them to speak. And they speak from a different perspective. My latest book is about the lives of ordinary people. Now, my wife says, being an academic, you've never met any ordinary people. <laughs> but she has, and she says some of them are interesting. <laughs> and so never having met them, I wrote about them. <laughs> uh, have you ever thought about the fact that the word academic means unrelated to the real world? Uh, in any case, I want to talk to you about the ordinary people, and they were different. Now, in the interest of full disclosure, I don't know a lot about Mormon thought, though I've learned some this week. Uh, I am certainly not a theologian, which will become apparent <laughs> in a moment. Um, I am a historian, and archaeologists by definition are historians. I'm not making a judgment about how it was in the past. I leave that to you. Uh, I don't know what you believe, and what I believe is not your business. I'm here to describe for you what it was like for most people in ancient Israel. Uh, and what we now know is that most of them were not monotheist. Margaret said this, and I could almost say it in the same words. Monotheism is a late, difficult, and somewhat arbitrary concept. Most great religions have been polytheistic. Now, what I want to say would have been controversial 30 years ago, and it was when I first began saying it, and now to my great disappointment, it's not controversial at all. <laughs> uh, it's conventional wisdom. Um, I don't think anyone any longer doubts that for most of the period of Israelite history, that is from around 1200 to around 600, uh, polytheism prevailed. Now, there is no doubt that those who wrote the Hebrew Bible were monotheists, rigid monotheists. There was only one God, and for them, that God was male. But the point is that in, in, the, in real life, uh, in ancient Israel, uh, most people had not arrived. I'm not saying that monotheism is an advance, it was a change. So I, I want to remind you that what I'm saying is standard mainstream scholarship today. Uh, nothing controversial about it, and I don't uh, think you will find it controversial. And I was surprised, uh, there's no collusion between Margaret and myself, but we're, we're going to say the same thing from different perspectives. So hold on, here we go. We're gonna go from uh, north to south roughly, and uh, from early to late. And I'm showing you just the tip of the iceberg. Almost everything I want to show you was unknown when I was a graduate student uh, in the Upper Paleolithic period. Um, <laughs> but now, uh, this is some of the new evidence, although there's much more that uh, I might show you. We're going to move from north to south through sites with which you're familiar. I know that you're all well-read. Many of you have been to Israel um, and the West Bank and Jordan. Uh, so just to remind you, here is our geography. The named sites are ones that you will know mostly from the Bible. The little dots represent hundreds of early Israelite sites from the period of the judges, most of which have no names and most of which are not excavated. So remember, we're talking about a 600 sweep of history from the days of the judges to the fall of Jerusalem in 586. Let's start with Dan, right on the northern border. In fact, the tell is bisected by the Syrian border today, and here you see the reconstructed city wall of about the 9th century BCE. Dan was, of course, not the political capital of the northern kingdom, but was the cultural capital for a very long time. The borders of Israel were from Dan to Beersheba. So here is the outer city gate, a triple entryway gate of the type that's common in the Iron Age. And just in this area here, I want to show you a little installation. Uh, which the Bible actually knows about, and this is probably what the Bible uh, means by a bama, 
a, a high place, an elevated uh, place in which uh, a god or gods could be worshipped. Now remember in the Hebrew Bible, the Bama is always condemned because it's part of Canaanite religion. Now look, I hope you see what I see. And archaeologists have wonderful imaginations, by the way. Once after one of my lectures, a woman said, I've never heard anybody make so much out of so little. <laughs> but look, I count five. These are standing stones, and once again, they're referred to in the Hebrew Bible. These are matzevot. Now, a matzeva is a standing stone, large or small, that commemorates the appearance of a deity. What's wrong with them? Well, again, they're Canaanites, so these are things that are forbidden. And already I want to warn you, much of what I'm showing you cannot be connected with the biblical text at all. It's the disconnect I want you to note. All right. Now, on the top of the mound, there really is another Bama, a very high place, a platform approached by a flight of steps here, and up here you see the main structure. This is an artist's reconstruction of it, but based on, on, on good archaeology. It's not the foundation for a missing temple, but it's rather a large platform reached by a flight of steps. This, then, is a classic example of a Bama. Now, by the way, in the Book of Kings, a Bama is mentioned at Dan and condemned. This is probably it. This is as close as you're ever going to get to an artifact that's actually mentioned in the biblical text. Now, next to that building or platform is a tripartite building, a small temple, and here you see it. It has three rooms, and that reminds you at once, of course, of the Temple of Solomon in Jerusalem, a tripartite building. It's probably the biblical lishcha, which is a kind of adjoining structure to a temple, and uh, I want you to notice in particular the features here. Here is a small altar, obviously built into the dirt floor, and here is a broken jar set into the ground, and this is where you would clean off the ashes and the bones from the animal sacrifices, and lo and behold, what do we find next to it but three iron shovels. Now, all of this is very reminiscent of the animal sacrifices that are common in early Israelite and later Israelite religion. So what's wrong with this? because it's not supposed to be here at Dan. It's supposed to be in Jerusalem in the temple under the supervision of the official priests. But here it is. So we have connections and we have disconnections. Now, we have what is a strange-looking thing, and by the way, we work in uh, uh, meters, so that's uh, uh, 20 centimeters. Uh, but this is a very large stone horn of a four-horned altar. Only the one was found, but we can reconstruct it. Here is one found at Beersheba, the southern limits of Israel and Judah, and it's been put back together uh, to show you what these horned altars looked like. This one was also found dismantled. Now, the Hebrew Bible talks about horned altars, but they're little uh, affairs, apparently, and they apparently used for incense. But these are monumental structures, so already we have horned altars, but not the kind that are described in the Bible. This is something different. And what are they doing at these two border outposts? Here is a small altar found at Dan, a little bit broken, but this thing's about a foot uh, square and about a foot tall. And we know that these were used for incense. Once again, burning incense is legitimate uh, in, in the cult, uh, but only under the supervision of priests. So we shouldn't have these altars here. Now, elsewhere on the surface of the mound has been found what is clearly an olive pressing installation. Here you see the platform uh, where the uh, baskets of olives were brought. Uh, here are the large stone weights that were on the end of the beam. This is a beam press. And here you see both a settling basin here uh, and over here. Now, why would you have an olive pressing installation in the precincts of a temple, even though the temple shouldn't be here? Because you're, well, it's first pressed virgin olive oil, not for salads. This is for anointing oneself, the hair and the beard and all. That's described in the Bible. But it shouldn't be done except under certain circumstances and under supervision. Now, among the other things found at Tal Dan is a bronze scepter, which must have been carried by a priest on the end of a wand of some sort. Not only that, the bronze foundry has been found where it was made. So we have a whole temple precinct at Dan with all the paraphernalia we should expect, but not here. There shouldn't be priests here. Oh, see where this is going to go? We're going to get in trouble. Uh, 
Now, of course, you can't uh, portray uh, the male deity or any other deity uh, according to the first and second commandments. There is no Israelite art. You cannot make representations. But here we have figurines of both um, a female here, and that's no surprise, uh, but we even have male figurines. Now, we'll come back to these figurines directly because they turn out to be very important. So the question is, who is he and who is she? Now, let's move to another site in the northern part of the country, the site of Tanakh, which is on the southern rim of the Jezreel Valley, a sister site of, Ber of Megiddo. Here, a German and American excavations have brought to, uh, to light a little village shrine, probably serving a number of households, and I want you to note several things. Here is the shrine itself, um, and uh, uh, we have a basin, uh, an altar, uh, a hearth, a cistern, and a number of other things. There was also found a bowl with several dozen polished astragali, sh sheep and bone uh, knuckle bones. What, what would those be for? Casting lots, magic divination, which is okay, but only in the hands of the priest. So somebody's doing magic here. By the way, what is religion? Is it about magic? Um, there were found other rather astonishing things. Uh, here is the basin, and once again, there's an olive pressing installation in this little village shrine. By the way, most people worshiped at these village shrines, not in the temple in Jerusalem, as we shall see, and this is a rather typical one. Now, among the really astonishing pieces found here were two terracotta offering stands. These were about three feet tall. Uh, this one is reconstructed here. It's from the 10th century BCE, the very age of Solomon. Now, there's not supposed to be any Israelite art, but here is a fantastic piece of Israelite art. On the top, you have a quadruped bearing a, a sun disk here, a winged sun disk. Then if you come down here, you have a sacred tree flanked by two uh, probably wild goats. And then here you have uh, two faces, an empty door. Notice the cherubs or the lion-like figures on the sides. And then we come down here to this scene. And I want to dwell on it for a moment because, again, who is she? Here we have a representation of a naked female, if memory serves me correctly. Um, and uh, she's holding two eye, uh, lions by the ears. What in the world is going on here? It's a charming scene, uh, but, but difficult to understand. Now, in the Iron Age, we have a lot of textual evidence for a female deity called the Lion Lady. So I suggest that this nude female is not a Jewish housewife. Uh, oh, I, su I suggest she is Asherah, the Lion Lady. And I'm going to build on that suggestion now to try to convince you, and this is exactly what Margaret has been saying. Here the lady is, uh, 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 full face as it were, the lion lady. Now, here also found in this little village shrine was a mold for making these terracotta female figurines. Why would you have a mold? Because they were mass produced. You could go to the shrine and for a shekel or so buy one of these and take it home. Today, we have more than 3,000 of these terracotta female figurines from ancient Israel and Judah, all the way from the 10th century uh, to the fall of Jerusalem, and then they, they disappear. So once again, who is she? She doesn't look too happy on this occasion, uh, but, but she is quite, quite naked, actually. And all, all we can see is at her breast a round object, and I want to come back to that. So the question is, what or who do these common figurines everywhere in use, what, what do they really tell us? What do they suggest? What do they mean? Now, from near Bethlehem, we have some bronze arrowheads from the period of the judges, about the 11th century, which are written in Paleo-Hebrew. And these belong to uh, probably professional archers who uh, were mercenaries, uh, probably, and they were in the service of various kings and various deities. Now, look at the name of this man. You all read Paleo-Hebrew, so all together now. Uh, Abd Labit, uh, here at the top, reading, of course, from right to the left. Abd Labit, the servant of the lion lady. So the lioness, the, the goddess, is his patron or patroness. And then if there's any doubt about it, you turn the arrow over, and here's his own name, Ben-Anat, the son of Anat. Now, in the Ugaritic texts of the late Bronze Age, Canaanite texts from 
the coast of Syria, we have hundreds of texts that are mythological, and they give us the full pantheon of Canaanite religion. The elderly pair, uh, Ael and Asherah, and then there's a younger pair, Baal and Anat. And there's a third female deity, uh, Astarte. So this guy's name really is the son of the goddess Anat. So the great mother can go by several names, as Margaret already said, and one of her names is Anat. That name only occurs once in the Hebrew Bible. She is scarcely remembered, and the goddess Astarte is also nearly invisible, but Asherah is all over the place. So you, you have further evidence of the lion lady, whoever she is, now, let's go to a third site. Tel el Fara is biblical Tirza. It became the capital in the ninth century of the northern kingdom before Omri moved the capital to Samaria. And the French excavations there have revealed a gate shrine. And here you see a double entryway gate. Um, and uh, once we're inside the gate, we see another basin, possibly for libations or possibly for olive oil. And we see a standing stone, a matzeva, which is about 10 feet tall. So you walk right into the gate of the city, and what do you see? First off, a shrine, a gate shrine. That turns out to be very important. So here again, we have things mentioned in the Bible, particularly the standing stone, the matzeva, uh, and, and a memory of village uh, and gate shrines. Now, among the things the French found uh, were, again, these figurines. I want you to notice in particular the one here, uh, which dates again from the 10th century, the age of Solomon, when you're not supposed to represent any gods or goddesses or even humans. Now, here she has a kind of skirt of some sort on, but she's bare-breasted, and she's holding, again, one of those large things. Now, this has sometimes been thought of as a tambourine, but one of my students is the foremost authority in the world in ancient musical instruments, and it's not a tambourine. Might be a frame drum. You can't play a tambourine clap, clasped to your breast. You'll do yourself an injury. Uh, so it's not that. Um, I suggest that it's a bread cake, a mold-made bread cake, and Margaret already talked about the famous passage in which the prophet Jeremiah says why it's so bad in the countryside that uh, the whole text is the children gather firewood and uh, the men build fires and the women bake cakes for the queen of heaven. Who is she? Who is she? Most scholars think Astarte. I think not. I think Asherah. So I think these are mold-made cakes. By the way, we have found the molds. And in later tradition, Jewish and particularly Roman Catholic, you still bake certain kinds of cakes at certain, in Cyprus, we, we bake cakes at Easter like this. And by the way, what does the word Easter come from? Ishtar, Astarte, okay. Long tradition, so we've already seen that. Now, all among the other finds at Tel El Fara was a naos, a miniature temple, a clay model temple about a foot tall. And I want you to notice several things. First of all, it is a doorway, obviously. Uh, the, probably there was an image of a figurine here at one time, but it's missing. And then what, what do we see he, here? These are trees. And here you see the volutes of a palm tree. They're turned upside down. I lived for 30 years in Tucson. I know all about palm trees. I have them in my yard in Cyprus. Believe me, this is a palm tree. So the temple entrance is flanked by two columns in the shape of stylized trees. Now look a little more closely. You see the crescent moon. We're dealing with astral and solar deities here. And you'll have to take my word for it. Those are the stars of the Pleiades. These are all heavenly symbols related in principle to feminine deities. So this is a model shrine. Now what in the world uh, is a model shrine doing at an early Israelite site in the 10th century? You have to wonder. For a long time, biblical scholars paid no attention to this. I've been talking about it for 30 years. That's not long in archeological time. <laughs> now at my wife's site, a medallion in Cyprus, this was found long ago, it's now in the Louvre, and it's clearly another one of these naoi, a temple model. And this one is really nice because she's at home. You see her in the doorway there? A nude female figure. And what are the columns if they are not trees? Here are the clear story windows. And in case you miss her, she's around here looking out the side windows. And if you go around the back, she's out there too. It's a slow Friday night. Uh, she's a priestess in the temple or female deity. She's drumming up a little business. So, so what in the world is going on with these model shrines, which we didn't even know about until recently? 
Clearly they have to do with feminine uh, deities or feminine figures of some kind. Now, a uh, uh, further example is from Transjordan, probably Moabite, uh, probably 8th century. And once again, we have one of these model shrines. And here you see the trees. Here we have both the upside down and the right side up volumes. And perched over the lintel is uh, a dove. Now, uh, Margaret talked about the famous uh, Jewish temple at Yeb in the island of Elephantini, uh, and we know that uh, in later times the goddess Asherah was connected with the Phoenician female deity Tanit, whose symbol is a dove. So the dove turns out to be, with the trees and the other symbols, uh, a, a reminiscence of, uh, of Asherah. Now here's another one that I published more recently, purchased on the open market, so we don't know its provenience, but it's almost certainly from uh, Transjordan. And once again, we have the vacant door here. We have the tree columns, and here they're mounted by two, and once again, the bird there, and what do we have down here? Two lions. Now, the problem for us is that everything has to be simple and clear. It wasn't in the ancient world. The, the symbol is, is difficult because many kinds of symbols are connected with Asherah. I've mentioned lions. Now we're talking about trees. We're talking about doves. Uh, so we have a variety of images, but I want to suggest for the ancients, they all pointed sort of in the same direction. Now, what is a symbol? It is a sign that points to an invisible or, or uh, sort of an ephemeral reality. So keep in mind signs and symbols. Now, here is another one, a Phoenician one, and here we have in the doorway uh, either a priestess or a feminine deity. And here the columns are very clear. These become standardized in Israelite architecture, and of course these are proto-Aeolic capitals. You see them later in Greek buildings, because the Greeks borrowed from the Phoenicians, and the Phoenicians borrowed from the sort of Canaanite Israelite realm. Uh, and once again, you have the winged sun disk. All these familiar uh, solar and astral uh, symbols connected with deities uh, standing in the doorways of temples. Now, here's another favorite of mine. This is also from uh, Cyprus, from Kition. And here you see a female uh, here wearing a peculiar headdo, a sort of bouffant wig. Keep that in mind. It turns out to be important. We know that a, a female figure wearing this wig in Egypt is Hathor. And I think Professor Thompson will talk about that perhaps this afternoon. And Hathor is the Israelite equivalent of the Canaanite Israelite deity Asherah. So keep in mind the connection, Hathor, uh, the cow goddess in Egypt, and Asherah, uh, the mother goddess in Canaan. Now, if there's any doubt about the whole business, she's wearing a naos on her head, like a hat. <laughs> And here, she's standing in the door, in case you missed her down here. So once again, a bewildering uh, variety of symbols, which all somehow come together to suggest that this is a, is a goddess connected with temples and various uh, symbols and images. Now, uh, not far from the Temple Mount in Jerusalem is a tomb in the garden of the French school, the Ecole Biblique. Uh, and there uh, we have ancient uh, Judean tombs. Years ago, I noticed that in the headrest on one of the benches of these tombs is the same wig. You see what I see? The Hathor wig. Here's my point. We used to say, well, out in the countryside, people were half pagan, of course, and they worshipped all kinds of deities. But in Jerusalem, the spiritual capital where the temple is, where God dwells, we are orthodox. Uh, but here is the point. Right under the nose of the priest in Jerusalem, a Judean woman could be buried for eternity with her head in the wig of the goddess. Priests didn't like it, but they were overruled. Now, let's move to the south, to the site of Arad, east of Beersheba today. Uh, and here, Israeli archaeologists have unearthed the only Israelite or Judean temple that we've ever found. When it was first found, nobody could believe it was a temple because there's only supposed to be one. But here we have one, and notice it's a tripart temple as well. You have the outer court, which is really an essential room, and then you have a long, narrow bench room here where offerings could be placed. Here is the big altar out here. And then you have here with H, the Holy of Holy, the inner sanctum of the temple. 
Uh, now, my name, Dever, is pronounced in Israel, Dever, usually, which unfortunately means plague or pestilence. <laughs> so I add a yud to it and pronounce it Dever, which means the Holy of Holies. <laughs> so uh, Professor Holy of Holies will now explain to you uh, what we have here in this temple of the 9th, 8th century. So I want to look uh, at the inner sanctum for just a moment, but perhaps first at the altar as well. Here is the way it's partly reconstructed today. Some of you may have been there and have seen it. And here you see the large altar. The open courtyard is here. The person for scale will give you an idea. Now, at the foot of the altar was found, guess what? Not a pussycat. Uh, this is a lion, a bronze lion, a lioness, probably a lion here. So once again, what is it doing as part of the offering uh, at a Judean temple, the only one we have? And I suggest that we have something to do with the lion lady here. And then notice this offering stand was found right near the altar, and we've lifted it up in the Israel Museum to show you that it's two pieces. The top part is a bowl, and what would you do with a bowl? Well, you could bring an offering of milk or wine or food or drink or whatever. Sounds very biblical. And then you could put the bowl back down on the stand, and what does the stand look like? All together now, a tree, a tree. So what's going on here? Now, fortunately, we have some written remains. We have several dozen ostraca, or inscribed pieces of pottery. And the one on the left, number 18, uh, actually talks about uh, a Beit Yahweh, a temple of Yahweh, Yahweh being the name of the Israelite national deity. And I don't think it's the one in Jerusalem. I think it's the one here. And a whole set of priestly families are named who have the same name as some of the names of the priests in the Bible. My point is here we have a fully functioning Judean temple with its own priesthood and its own rituals and its own offerings, a rival of the Jerusalem temple. And in the minds of the Deuteronomistic historians, the ones who wrote the great history from Joshua through Judges, Samuel, and Kings, there is only one temple. The temp That's the central theme. There is only one legitimate temple, but there was more than one. Now, let's go to the inner sanctum of the temple, and here you see two little incense altars, and bits of uh, um, substance were found that suggest incense. What's wrong with burning incense? Nothing, but not here. Now, we have a matzivah inside, a standing stone that represents a deity, and you can count as well as I. There are two, and one is a little bit shorter. But in fact, there were three in the beginning. And what's very interesting is these were not found this way. They were found carefully laid down and buried under a plaster floor. Now, many scholars suggest that either in the reforms of Hezekiah in the 8th century or the reforms of Josiah in the 7th century, uh, 6th century, uh, there were attempts to, to do away with these so-called pagan shrines. Read 2 Kings 23. What does Josiah do? He, he tries to get rid of the Matzevot and the Bamot, all these pagan Canaanite symbols and deities. So my suggestion is that the officials came down from Jerusalem one day and said, look, guys, the king doesn't like this stuff. You've got to do something to get rid of these, these Canaanite things. Okay, okay. So they go home, uh, they, they bury them, and after the priests are gone, they dig them back up. So I think we have real evidence of efforts at cult reform. Now, why would the prophets... Uh, and reformers complain about polytheistic practices unless they were widespread. Okay? They knew what they were talking about. Sometimes when you read the Bible, you have to read between the lines. And when you do, you understand the polemics against Canaanite religion because it was everywhere. So, by the way, what is the one thing uh, that they, the prophets always say in, in regard to the Israelites and Judeans? Why, why on every high hill and under every green tree, they, what's wrong with high hills and green trees? Because it's all connected with the Canaanite cult of Asherah. So I think you have her here, and I think there you have Yahweh and Asherah. Again, I thought that 30 years ago. I neglected to publish it, and now everybody knows it. Now, we have another temple at Lachish in the south, a great Judean border fortress, and there we have 
a marvelous representation of the old Canaanite goddess Asherah uh, in pre-Israelite times. And notice that she's riding not on a lion, but on a horse, a war horse, as a matter of fact. And again, she's quite nude, wearing the Atef crown and holding the lotus blossoms. So with good reason, I think we can suggest this is Canaanite Asherah in pre-Israelite times. This is the old mother goddess. And sometimes she is warlike. Some, oddly enough, she can be the, the goddess who brings life and the goddess who brings death. These polar opposites are typical of Canaanite religion. So here we have, I think, the old goddess herself in one of her guises. Now, we also have a, a large uh, jar uh, in which there were several joints of mutton, and we have a proto-Canaanite inscription, uh, which runs around here, and uh, it reads basically, a lamb, a gift for my lady, a lot, a lot. A lot is the feminine form of ale. So you have the male and the female deity, ale and a lot. Now, there are two names in the Hebrew Bible for, for God. One is Yahweh, the national deity. The other name is ale the name of the old Canaanite high god, and it appears not only in the singular, but in the plural, the gods, the gods. So here we have the pair in Canaanite uh, lore, and we even have an inscription that names her a lot. Now, uh, Ruth Hestron was a curator of the Israel Museum, a wonderful woman, a kibbutznik, didn't have a lot of formal education, but she had a lot of insight. And she came to me one day and she said, I, I've made some great discoveries, but nobody wants to publish it. I'll bet Margaret has had that experience, and so have I. <laughs> you have a new idea and nobody likes it. Well, here's what she explained. She said, we all know about a whole series of these pendants, gold or electrum or silver, and they clearly represent who? Where have we seen the wig before? So these are late Bronze Age, Canaanite, and they clearly are representations of Hathor. Um, now, notice the arms are not modeled, nor are the legs, only the torso is. These are the breasts, and what she pointed out, uh, I, at the risk of being uh, indelicate here, I have to say, what you see here is not pubic hair, it's not the dark line on the abdomen of a pregnant woman, it is rather a tree growing out of the vulva. She was the first one to figure this out. Hathor and Asherah are connected with trees, and these amulets absolutely uh, are, are evidence of the tree. So the pubic triangle becomes the symbol of the unimaginable life-giving power of women. Well, nothing is more basic than that in the ancient world, than birth and survival. So keep, we're talking about what used to be called fertility cults. Uh, the, the term is no longer appropriate, politically incorrect. Um, so let's talk about plenty instead. Let's talk about plenty. All right. Now, she also um, reminded us of this image, and I think Professor Thompson's going to show it this afternoon too. This is from the tomb of Thutmose III, maybe even the prince of Egypt. And do you see what I see? He has been nourished, he's being nourished by the breast of a tree. A tree! A tree goddess. She was the first to connect this with Asherah. A little bit later, she got the article published, and it was brilliant. A brilliant insight into the nature of, of both Canaanite and Israelite religion. So bear in mind the tree goddess suckling a, a young one. She also uh, reminded us of this, and I think Thompson is going to show it again. And here you say uh, uh, worshippers venerating a goddess whose body is in the shape of the trunk of a tree. This tree imagery goes all the way back to early Egypt and early Mesopotamia. It's all over the place in Canaan. It's borrowed into Israel. Now, years ago, I was driving out in the Syrian desert on my way to Palmyra, where, where there was no road, and I drove for several days. And beyond that, I went all the way to Baghdad. Not a trip I would recommend this year. Uh, but the farther out I got into the desert, the, I realized there were very few trees. And finally, there was only this one. And I drove up to it got out of the old VW camper, and the tree was festooned with little bits of women's clothing, little wisps of hair, and little messages in Arabic, prayers to the tree. Now, come with me to Cyprus, and I'll take you to 8th and 9th century uh, Greek Orthodox churches, and almost always in the courtyard of the church is an old olive tree, centuries old, and once again, somebody has a hand that hurts, so they model a hand and hang it on the tree. In folk religion, the tree 
imagery has never disappeared. It never disappeared. So think about trees. You have a lot of trees here, so they're not very important. But I grew up in the desert where there aren't many. So the veneration of a single, solitary, surviving tree, tree out in the desert seems quite miraculous. So why not? Why not? Now, I want to take you to the most remarkable uh, Israelite Judean site ever excavated, the site of Kuntilat Ajrud in the eastern Sinai Desert, excavated by Zev Meshel in 1978, but explored a century before that by British uh, uh, explorers. Uh, here is the site uh, in the uh, eastern Sinai Desert, Ajrud, right here. It's on the old caravan routes through the Sinai Desert, very remote and uh, inhospitable area. I've spent long summers in the Negev and Sinai Deserts, and I'd lived 30 years in Arizona in the desert. I, I like deserts, um, and we spend our life now, much of it in Cyprus, in the desert regions of Cyprus. So here is the site of Kuntila Ajrud. We don't know its ancient name. Um, here you see the Bedouins still today pass this way, and in the back you see the hill itself, and then the site uh, itself is a fort. It's a fort combined with a gate shrine. It's what we would call a caravan sarai, a stopover station. I've stopped over many times while driving in the wilds of the Middle East and put in overnight at one of these stations where you're quite safe. Now, more uh, Hebrew inscriptions have been found uh, at this site than in any other single site. They were not published even though they were found in 1978 until about six months ago. Why, did, why weren't they published? Because they're sensational. That's the problem. They're too sensational. I'll read this one in Hebrew. We now have the rest of it, but what it says is Yetiv Yahweh. May, may God bless. The point is you're traveling out here in the desert, uh, and uh, it's a dangerous journey, and you stop in at this fort where there is a gate shrine, a little temple, and you, you leave a prayer. Why not? It's a very good idea. Uh, if you're traveling to the Middle East today, out, out of uh, John F. Kennedy, there are chapels there. I suggest you visit all three. It Can, can't hurt. So a prayer for a safe journey. Not only that, people brought gifts there. Here is a huge bowl that somebody left as a votive offering, and the Hebrew inscription around the edge is wonderful. It reads, belonging to Abyo ben Adna, blessed be he by Yahweh. Now these are biblical names, people we know very well. We know the name of Yahweh, the God of Israel. And the phrase at the bottom might as well be out of the Bible, may Yahweh bless. A, a blessing, a priestly blessing. And what are priests doing out here? And what is this sanctuary doing out here in the middle of nowhere? Well, it's quite remarkable. Now, uh, happily, Margaret also mentioned the bovine imagery. And here on one of the large store jars, we have, well, not a bull, but a cow, and a cow suckling her calf. Now, try to memorize everything about the cow and the calf, because this is the kind of Israelite art we shouldn't have, but here it is, and I want to show you in a moment the Canaanite background, the prototype. So there's the Israelite Judean one from, let's say, the 8th century, and then from about the 9th century, we have this Phoenician one. Uh, and obviously, uh, the local artist at this shrine is imitating Canaanite art forms. And they're art forms that have somehow to do with the cow. And I've learned from her how important that imagery is. I, I think she's onto something terribly important there. Now, on one of the other painted jars, there's what is obviously, I suggest, a stylized tree. You see the trunk there? and the top and the branches, and very often in Canaanite art, you have two horned uh, animals, probably wild goats, nibbling at the tree. So keep in mind the tree imagery. And then, hmm, another lion. So the lions and the trees uh, is Asherah to be found somewhere in this shrine. Well, now the Hebrew inscriptions mention at least five deities. Ael, we would expect, and Baal, Ael's rival in uh, the Hebrew Bible, and uh, Asherah, and, and probably one or two others. So the texts that we have, uh, and, and uh, there are quite a few of them, talk about various deities. Here's a wonderful processional scene from a large jar. It shows uh, several people apparently proceeding toward a throne or an altar of some sort. They're dressed in a very odd sort of way. This is the only example we really have of clothing from ancient Israel or Judah. And uh, while we don't know exactly what's going on, it looks like they're, they're praying or, or bringing offerings. And I, I always say, while we don't know what the service is from the looks of their hair, it's why it's electrifying. 
Um, so what in the world is, these cultic scenes were totally unheard of in 1978. I saw them with the excavator the first time. I, I simply couldn't believe my eyes. And I urged him to publish, but it took him all this time. This, this is truly sensational. Now, here's the most important uh, large store jar. And uh, unfortunately, all this stuff now has had to go back to Egypt in the agreements that Israel has made with Egypt. And uh, who knows what will happen, but it's happily published. Now, here is the jar itself before it was restored. And then I want to show you an artist's rendering of the scene because this is really quite remarkable. Now, here we have a pair of figures, very odd looking. Uh, they seem to uh, have leonine heads. Uh, they're wearing a sort of polka dotted skin, which some think a leopard skin. Uh, this one seems to have a, a tail, uh, but this one has breasts. And well, I think that's not a tail. Um, these are probably representations of the Egyptian god Bess, who is the, uh, the god connected with the cult, god of, of rejoicing and, and good times and good fortune. And don't worry, god, uh, Bess appears both as male and female, so no worry. So some scholars believe this is Ael and Yahweh, uh, or uh, Ael and Asherah, or Yahweh and Asherah. Now, I want to look instead at the seated figure. Look carefully, where, where do we have any parallels for that sort of thing? Here is an ivory from Megiddo, a Canaanite ivory of about 1200, and I want you to notice that the king, uh, people bearing gifts, and here's a lyre player, he's sitting on a lion throne. It's a chair uh, which is fashioned like a lion, he's sitting on the back, and then the sides are formed by the wings, the feathered wings of the lion, but it's a cherub. It has a human face, the body of a lion, the wings of a bird, and a human face, and his feet are on a little footstool. So that's what a lion throne is. That's what a lion throne is. Here's another example from the Louvre. This is the sarcophagus of King Hiram of Tyre, and he's sitting on the same kind of lion throne. There are the wings, uh, there's the tail, there's the footstool, uh, and this is an even older one, and this is Ael, the great Canaanite deity, sitting again on a very stylized lion throne. And here are two electrum plaque, uh, plaques from uh, uh, pendants from Ugarit, and once again we see seated figures on lion thrones. Now here the throne is very stylized, but you can still see the legs, you can see the claws, and these are the feathers of the wings, and that's the tail, and there's the footstool. And notice... She, apparently, with a long uh, dress, is holding out something in front of her. Now, let's go back to our scene. Do you see what I see? Here is the lion throne. Here are the panels that represent the feathers of the wings. There's the back turned tail. There are the claws. And the artist forgot the stool. So her feet don't. My wife is short. Her feet never reach the floor either. And what is she doing? She's playing, apparently, a liar. She is a half-nude female, clearly. The breasts are seen. So who is she? Now, now look at the Hebrew text. It's all about blessings for those who are deceased. And I top part's not so important. But it reads roughly like this. May X or so-and-so be blessed by... Uh, let's... Oh, my, what does it say? Uh, by Asherah of... Oh by, hmm, by uh, Yahweh of Samaria and his Asherah. So who or what is Asherah? And what is she doing related to Yahweh in a context of blessing in a funerary cult? Now here's the problem. The term Asherah in Hebrew occurs 40 times in the Hebrew Bible. And mostly it, it represents some kind of symbol. Uh, you're, you're not to have this thing. Uh, you're, you're, when you find one, you're to cut it down. The verbs are all to cut it down, chop it up, and burn it because it's bad. It represents the Canaanite deity Asherah. So it's only a symbol, a tree-like symbol. A living tree or a wooden pole, we know what it is. Here's the catch. In at least five or six times, the term Asherah is a personal name. It talks about Baal and Asherah. If Baal is a deity, so is Asherah. You cannot get around the text. The term Asherah sometimes means only the symbol of the great lady, but sometimes it's her personal name. So she is named in several texts. But what the biblical writers do is exactly what Margaret said. They, they try to bury her. They try to obscure the references so you, you won't see her. You can't change the consonantal text. It's becoming scripture, but you can tinker with it. Exactly what she said. So 
there is an attempt to, to, to drive her underground because she's by now becoming anathema. But she's the old Canaanite mother goddess who had been revered in Israel from start to finish, all the way to the end of the monarchy. So here she is. So these texts are remarkable, but only recently have scholars begun to take them seriously. Now let's look at a few other sites. Here's the site of Beersheba in the south. We talked about it earlier. And the altar I showed you was found actually up here uh, in this area, right in here, the stones dismantled, and they were built into the wall of these storage buildings. But they obviously belonged together at one time, and here they are again. So there were clearly attempts to, to do away with the Canaanite cult altogether. Probably never very successful. The point I want to make is the Canaanite cult had been tolerated for centuries. And even in the temple in Jerusalem, there were images. I wouldn't be surprised if there was a life-size statue of Asherah right in the temple in Jerusalem. That's what the prophets were talking about, that, precisely that. So finally, by the 8th and 7th centuries, there is an attempt to, to, to purge the cult of all these items connected with the old mother goddess. And the biblical texts are quite clear about it. So uh, I've been trying to show you that those texts have a real-life context. Now, here is the most important archaeological site ever excavated in Israel, namely mine. Uh, this is the site of Kirbet el Kom, probably biblical Makedah, which I excavated following the 67 war in a salvage excavation. Here's one of the first days we went down. We found the whole village out here robbing the cemetery. Here in the foreground, there are hundreds and hundreds of 8th century tombs. They were bargaining over the pots, uh, wanted to sell them to us, throwing skulls up in the air like basketballs. They were having a grand time. Uh, so we did a, three seasons of salvage excavations here, and I want to show you just one of our finds. Here is a tomb which uh, they had dug out. But we reinvestigated and found two Hebrew inscriptions from the 8th century in the tomb. And here's the one I want to show you. Now, I found this in 1968, long before the Ajrud excavation. So when I found this inscription, it was unique. I was standing in the field one day drawing a tomb in October. It was about to rain, and an Arab from the village came up with a stone under his arm, and he squatted down and lit a cigarette and looked off into the distance as Arabs will. And finally he said, uh, do you ever buy Hebrew inscriptions? So I said, well, sure. I'd never seen one, actually. Uh, but I knew I couldn't express any interest. The price would go up. So I said, sure, all the time. Uh, so he said, uh, how much? I said, uh, dinar, two, two dinars. That's about $7. He said, tell you, I'll, I'll take it. So I bought the inscription. Uh, I, I couldn't show any interest. I, I took it home, began to read it, and I nearly fainted. Because let me read it for you. It belongs to about 750, the same period as the other inscriptions, and here's the first line. One letter is missing, although we can reconstruct it. It reads, belonging to Uriyahu, the governor, this is his inscription. So Uriyahu is buried in this tomb. Uriyahu is a biblical name. It means may Yahweh be my light. It's a beautiful Hebrew name. So, so we know who he is. The, the second line could be out of the Bible. Baruch Hu Le Yahweh. May he be blessed by Yahweh. This is biblical language. It's biblical Hebrew. But this line is the clincher. Now I'll read it all together. This is for Uriahu, the governor. This is his inscription. May he be blessed by Yahweh and saved from his enemies by his Asherah. The first time we ever found the reading. Same reading as Ajru. And there can be, if you read Paleo-Hebrew, you see what I see. His Asherah, not some Asherah. Now, when I first published this in 1969, uh, uh, scholars said, oh, no, oh, no, no, the, the Asherah here means only a tree. So it reads, may, may uh, X be blessed by Yahweh and his tree. That doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, so I'll tell you what I did. I was very young. This was my first uh, publication, and I finished it the night my son was born. They wouldn't let you go to the hospital in those days, so I waited for the phone and I put the final touches on this article. I showed it to Albright and Cross and Nave, the greatest epigraphers in the world, uh, at my son's party when he came home, and they, they, they wouldn't believe it either. So I, I published it with a convenient reading. I didn't read Ashra, but today in my notes, in my file, is the reading Ashra. I wish I'd had the courage to come out, like Margaret has, against conventional scholarship and read it belonging to Yahweh in his Asherah, but I didn't. Now everybody reads in that way. So you say, well, we only have two inscriptions mentioning uh, Yahweh and his Asherah. 
but we only have two altogether, so that's 100%. Uh, <laughs> it only takes one, but now we have two. So, you know, biblical scholars always say, oh, artifacts don't bother us with pottery. We want to see inscription. Show us text. Okay, here are the text. But I tell you, when I published this, no, no one wanted to see it this way. Uh, and uh, it's one of the few things I've actually been right about. Uh, but I was. Now, let's turn to the Jerusalem in, in conclusion. Now, uh, as you know, Jerusalem is, is uh, not an archaeological site. It's not a museum. It's a living city. And there have been dozens and dozens of excavations, but very few systematic excavations. Here is the village of Siloam today, Siloam. Here is the Temple Mount, as it now appears. So the city of David is here, excavated by Kenyon here, and later by Shiloh and others here. But the Temple Mount here has never been excavated. We know that the Solomonic Temple would have stood here, approximately under the Golden Dome, which was erected by the Muslims in the 7th century. We also know that they leveled the whole area down to bedrock, and even before that, the second temple, the Herodian temple, would have destroyed any remains. So what I want to tell you is, don't apply for an excavation license uh, to, to find Solomon's temple. You'd never get a license from the Israelis or from the Muslim authorities, and you wouldn't find anything anyway. So what we know about the temple comes from other temples found in other places, and we have several dozen. And I suggest that next year or the following year, you should pursue the theme of the temple. I know you're interested in that because we now know a great deal about the Solomonic temple. There are about a dozen people in the world, and only a dozen, uh, who are authorities, but I'll give you their names and you can invite them. They're all very expensive, by the way. Uh, but let's think about the temple. Uh, here is a good artist's notion. This is Lean Rittmeyer's notion of what the city looked like. Here's the residential quarter here, the city walls, the old spring down here, the virgin spring. And up here, uh, you have the temple, the palace, the hall of justice, the harem. Solomon had, you know, a thousand wives. That's quite a large bedroom. So, uh, but of these things, we have no, no remains, and we never will have. So let's uh, try to think a little, at least, about the temple. Here's one artist's notion of what it looked like. There are other better notions today. This is from Albright uh, and Wright, my teachers and their teachers. Uh, it's one idea. It's a very Phoenician-style building. Now, I'm going to disappoint you. I know your longstanding interest in, in temple studies, but the heart of Israelite religion was not the Jerusalem temple. Most people had never seen it. They had never been to Jerusalem in their whole life. It was a long and dangerous and difficult journey. And even if they'd gotten there, they couldn't get in. This is a royal chapel for the king and a few officials, the high priest. This is not a, a public place of worship. So I have to tell you that for most of, of ancient Israelites, the temple was of no interest. They knew little about it and, and couldn't have cared less. So that will be news to you, but, but we can demonstrate it archaeologically. The temple was terribly important, crucial for those who wrote the Bible. It is a temple theology that we have, but for most people, it's about as important as, as Washington is for us these days. <laughs> so forget about the temple. Uh, or recon I hope you don't plan to restore it. That, that would be a messy business. Now, the only surviving fragment of the temple we have is this little thumb-sized pomegranate in the Israel Museum, but it was bought on the open market, so it may not be genuine, and many people think it's not. But again, I'll read the Hebrew for you. Set aside or concentrated for the priest for the temple of, and it's broken, so we don't have the name of the deity. But it may be a genuine relic of the Solomonic Temple, though a century or two later. That, that's about all the direct evidence we have, and so I want to suggest we, we should move on. Now, in Jerusalem, not far from the temple, were found many more of these terracotta figurines, and these were published by Kenyon. Uh, these are late, 7th century. Notice we have, once again, the woman with the large object at her breast, and then we have the more common ones, which are called Judean pillar-based figurines, because they're all Judean, and they're all 8th, 7th century, and the lower body is only a kind of pillar, but do you think it could be a tree trunk? That has long been suggested. Now, when you look at these, first you notice the heads are all broken off. Why would they all be broken unless somebody was trying to, hmm? okay? Where were they found? They were found in a dump. It looks like somebody's trying to get rid of these figurines and break them up. In 2 Kings 23, what is it says Josiah did? He, he broke up all the, the paraphernalia of Asher in the temple and threw it out. And this is 100 yards from the temple mount. Uh, so keep in mind these figurines. 
Now, let's sum up by looking at some other paraphernalia. We've talked about the four horned altars. In some ways, they fit the biblical description. In other ways, they don't. Here are some of these offering stands again. Now, while the altars are mentioned in the Hebrew Bible, I have gone through it word for word. There, there are no references to these offering stands. There are references to offerings, but not the stands. So the biblical writers had to know about all this kind of thing, but they're just not going to talk about it. They're just not going to mention it because they don't like this stuff. So remember, the Hebrew Bible tells you only what the authors wanted you to know and nothing more. I'm going to tell you the rest. Now, this is the weirdest one of these stands I've ever seen. This is from an early Israelite site, the site of Ai, uh, from the 12th century, period of the Judges. It stands about three feet high, and we know that on top there was a bowl for offerings. Incense was no doubt burned, and the smoke would waft out through the windows, or maybe a door. But on the bottom, we have feet. Any Freudian uh, psychiatrist here? Um, what is this, a foot fetish? I you see, I think you could model the temple. You, you could portray the, the great lady, but you had to be very careful about portraying Yahweh himself. But you could show his feet. It's all right. He's here. You see his see, feet? He's here. But you can't see his face. Remember, in the revelation to Moses, Yahweh says, I, I will pray before you and you can see my backside, but you can't see my face. So I think these are Yahweh's feet. I've never heard anybody suggest that, but then most biblical scholars have never even looked at this. But it's an early Israelite offering stand with feet. Uh, interesting. Now, here are some other things. Uh, this is an incense burner here. Uh, this also, notice we have animal zoomorphic figurines as well as human figurines. This is a rattle, and I don't think it's a toy. I think it's part of the music that was part of the cult. But none of these things are ever mentioned anywhere in the Hebrew Bible, never. This is a vessel called a kernos, a magic vessel. It has a hollow ring, and you can uh, make it bend over uh, and drink in this way, and when you tilt it up, the oil or wine circulates here, and then when you turn it over the way, the other way it pours out. It's a libation uh, vessel, and libations are described in the Hebrew Bible, but there is nowhere any description of these vessels. So what the biblical writers say and what they don't say, but both are important. Um, so here we have the kinds of things they don't talk about. Here's one from Upper Galilee, and it's an Israelite one, and it has a bird, not surprising, and it has a pomegranate, another symbol of fertility. Now, the horse and rider figurines are difficult to, to figure out, but it says in 2 Kings 23, Josiah threw out of the temple the horses and chariots of the gods. And we know from Canaanite art that the god, particularly the god Baal, the storm god, is portrayed as riding across the heavens every day in his chariot. And in Psalms, Yahweh is called cloud rider. Cloud rider. So the imagery of the Canaanite deities is found frequently in the Hebrew Bible, both male and female. So I think these are the horses and chariots. Here's a typical Canaanite example of the god riding his chariot across the sky. Now, I want to close by talking a little more about these figurines. Here are some from Jerusalem and Lachish. We've talked about the ones on the right, Judean pillar-based figurines. There are two kinds. There's the kind with a mold-made head, and then there's the sort of poor woman's uh, image with a sort of pinched face. Uh, the one on the left is from Jerusalem. Now, what do you see? And what did the ancients see? When, when a woman or a man handled one of these, what, what went through their minds? They knew intuitively what these were, and it's up to us to try to find out. Now, many scholars have said these represent human worshipers. These are Judean mothers and daughters and maybe even priestesses or even queen mothers, but they're, they're mortals. Now, I do not think that any Judean woman would have portrayed herself naked. I just don't think so. And believe me, they're naked. Um, the other thing that many scholars say, well, there's no iconography here. There's no symbolism that would suggest that these are deities. Now I'm going to do something risky. I've noticed that most of the people who say there's, there's no symbolism here are women scholars. Now, maybe for many women, breasts are just another organ of the body, very practical for a nursing infants. But for men, believe me, <laughs> they're very different. <laughs> they are certainly symbolic. And I think they are symbol they're symbols of, of, of the great mother who brings life and who nourishes and comforts us. 
So you can see already, I'm a bit in love with the great lady myself. I always have been. I always call my wife my lady. She is my lady. So I think these are meant to connote somehow the idea of, of, of women's magical powers to create life and to sustain life. They have often been con called fertility figurines, and I think we should think about that. And they are so common in folk religion that we have to make something of I believe they are representations of the great goddess Asherah, and I've noticed scholars are slowly coming around. My wife has argued for years, no, no, they're votives. A week ago she told me, well, I, I think you're right. The only time she ever said I was right. Uh, but uh, I've even convinced her. By the way, we used to give a joint lecture, and I would talk about the great lady. Uh, I was the bill lecturer, and she would stand up in the audience and challenge me and come up and take away the microphone and start to talk. And people were, it's a dog and pony show. Uh, this, <laughs> we, we did it at Columbia. It's wonderful. So I've even convinced her. I think you're looking at Asherah, the great goddess. And here she is, the one from Jerusalem, and can there be any doubt that this is about nurturing? I think there could be, what can one say, formidable? All right. Now, I want to show you, however, in closing, the Phoenician ones, which are different. And there we have a Phoenician one, and she really is playing a, a frame drum or a tambourine. The Phoenician ones are entirely different. Here, some of the Phoenician ones show a pregnant woman or a woman nursing a baby. But the Judean ones are different. Uh, and then finally, uh, we have good examples of the late bronze Canaanite ones. Now, again, at the risk of being indelicate, I want to show you this one. Now, just as the breasts are the point of the Judean ones, what, is the, what are you supposed to see here? The pubic triangle. I was lecturing one day, and a woman spoke of the audience. Oh, she says that symbol is everywhere today. And I, Madam, oh, she said it's all along the highway, and it means yield. <laughs> right on, lady. <laughs> yield. So there's the Canaanite mother. There's the mother goddess uh, in Canaan, and now we've seen the much more modest version in Israel and Judah. The, in other words, she is the, excuse me, the whore of the gods, but Asherah is the patroness of mothers. And I think of, of, of fathers as well. I think she was widely venerated. Now, here again is the Canaanite goddess. You see the difference? You see the difference between the Israelite Judean ones and the Canaanite one? Now, we have a, from the Winchester plaque, uh, now lost, uh, I understand, uh, here, a, a representation of Hathor. We've seen her already with her wig, uh, holding real iconographic symbols, and riding her lion, and the Egyptian description gives all of her names. Kudshu, who is uh, Hathor, who is uh, Asra, and Anat, and Astarte. There she is, with all of her names. But the Judean ones are not labeled. We have to supply the label, and I've tried to do that for you. Here are some Philistine ones, and they're very different as well. So we know that Asherah was widely venerated, and from the site of Tel Mikne, which is Philistine Ekron, we have Aramaic and Phoenician uh, inscriptions which say Ashrat, the feminine form in Phoenician. So the goddess Asherah was widely venerated in the Iron Age, both by Israel and Judah and by their neighbors as well. We've talked about the male deities, and here you see Canaanite uh, Ael seated on his throne, but we've gave, given more attention to the female deities. And here she is again, Canaanite Asherah, on her lion, here with her wig, as we would expect. As we now know, of course, the mother goddess cult goes all the way back to Neolithic and even Paleolithic times. This is a famous representation of a goddess from Shahar Golan from about the uh, 8th millennium BCE, 10,000. Don't worry, she's going to Weight Watchers next week. Uh, but, but what is interesting is we don't have any male figurines of these type. And by the way, even though we have nearly 3,000 female figurines from ancient Israel, we don't have a single male figurine. In other words, okay, you, you, could, you could represent her, but be careful. There are limits. Well, you, you can't represent him. That, that's going too far. Okay. Now, close with this. This is the famous plaque from the uh, Ludovici throne now in the National Museum in Rome from the second century uh, AD. According to Roman uh, legends, um, Aphrodite was born off the south coast of Cyprus at Paphos, uh, buoyed up by the froth on the uh, crest of the waves. Now, Aphrodite is the Greco-Roman version of Asherah. All these Canaanite gods and goddesses, most of them, were remembered in ancient Israel, passed down to the Phoenicians, onto the Greeks, and onto the Romans. So Ael becomes Zeus in the 
came in the later pantheon. Uh, Asura, the goddess of love and, and beauty and fertility, becomes Aphrodite. Uh, Baal becomes Adonis, the, the Lord. And uh, the Romans in turn bar all these old gods and goddesses. So Aphrodite in, Rome, in her Roman version is seen here. Uh, again, coming out of the sea, nude, being clothed by her maidens. Now, uh, at, at Paphos today, not far from where we live, is Aphrodite's beach. And if you go there on a, a good day in the summer there, you, you can almost see Aphrodite coming out of the sea, and there are lots of Aphrodites because it's a nude beach. <laughs> and when the Scandinavians arrive, there are lots of Asherahs, uh, Aphrodites. So there's a long history to, to the Great Mother uh, and uh, a history that we're only now beginning to appreciate. Now, I want to end with a uh, reinforcement of what Margaret said. She talked about monotheism. Monotheism, I'll word it slightly different, is a late construct, difficult, extremely difficult, sometimes arbitrary. In the end, Israelite and Judean religion do become monotheistic, but only after the fall of the temple and the tragedy that befell Judah. So sitting in exiles, those who edited the Bible said, see where we went wrong, don't ever do this again. So Judaism becomes originally monotheistic religion, or does it? We've already mentioned the Shekinah. In medieval mystic Jewish literature, in the Zohar, you have a tiered heaven, and the portrait of heaven is in the form of a tree, and up here is Yahweh, and then there appears the Shekinah. The word is feminine, her role is feminine. She is God's, Yahweh's representative on earth. He is in the distant heavens, but she is on earth. She is called the Matronit, the mother, and she's called the bride, of Yahweh. So who is Shekinah? Well, on Friday night, she goes back to heaven, and she and Yahweh have intercourse. In Orthodox Jewish circles, it's, it's a ritual, it's a commandment. You must have intercourse on Friday night. If you go to a, a, a Kabbalistic synagogue in Jerusalem, you will swear you're at a wedding feast, and you are. You are. So Yahweh and his bride cohabit. Now, the rabbis hated that stuff, and they tried to drive the Kabbalist underground, but there's a revival of Kabbalistic literature today. Then we turn to Christianity, and of course Christianity is a monotheistic religion, except for the fact that you have the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and Mary, the Mother of God. <laughs> uh, she took you to some churches. Go with me to Chartres and look at the West Transept, and there is Yahweh, all in majesty. And who is at his right hand? Jesus? No. Mary, Mary. Again, the bishops and the priests have been embarrassed by Mariolatry, but in, in developing countries. Now, I want to end with this note. You see, sometimes we say, well, this is all, this is all symbolism. It, the tree is only a symbol. Now, I think you appreciate symbols. A lot of Protestants don't. Catholics appreciate symbols, and so do Jews. Would you say to the survivor of, of, of people who were lost in the Holocaust uh, about uh, the Star of David, it's only a couple of triangles, really? Would you say to a pious Roman Catholic woman, it's only a couple of sticks, really? The symbol means nothing unless there stands behind it some invisible but powerful reality. And I think for many people in ancient Israel, they could not conceive of God except in, 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 in an engendered way. And that should be no surprise. My daughter Hannah is now 30. When she was five, we were discussing theology, as she is wont to do. And she said, uh, she said, do you know that God is a woman? And I said, yeah, yeah, sweetie, your mother and I know that. We write about it. And I thought I would press a bit. So I, I asked, I said, well, why should that be so? And she looked at me as only a five-year-old can look at an adult. And she said, silly, because half the people in the world are women and God has to be for everybody. Bingo. Thank you. Uh -huh.